Okay, welcome everybody. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to a conversation with black leaders where we want to address uh, racism <clears throat> in our society and in the Jewish community and all over. And um, we'll just say uh, just a few words of introduction since uh, we're uh, <clears throat> really gathering also as a religious, as a spiritual community. And uh, we have similar types of values uh, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the Dharmic tradition, and that is that each of us are created in the image of God. Each of us is precious, absolute value. Each one uh, deserves equality. Each one is unique. Each one is responsible for the world. And our tradition, more than any other commandment in the whole Hebrew scriptures, is you shall love the estranged. You should love the after metager. 36 times it's mentioned in the Torah, more than any other mitzvah. We have the, the uh, tremendous paradigm of the exodus from Egypt. We know what it was like to be slaves. We were slaves in Egypt, and much of our tradition was based on creating equality and justice. We teach justice, justice shall you pursue. We teach you should not stand by idly the blood of your neighbor. We are to be empowered to uplift the world through love and through, through justice. Uh, even uh, the way we treat enemies, so to speak, is very illustrative of our compassion. Uh, you know, the law says that if we see a neighbor's ox that needs to uh, be loaded and a neighbor's ox that needs to be unloaded, we should go to the one who needs to be unloaded first because of the pain to the animal. However, we see, if we see an enemy's uh, ox, that needs to be loaded, and a friend's ox that needs to be unloaded, we are to go to the enemy's ox first, even though the um, animal might suffer some pain because of the potential of transforming an enemy into a friend uh, through relationship, through getting to know the other. We're all interconnected, we're all one. And the final thing I just wanna say is the whole notion of slavery in the Hebrew Bible also uh, is illustrative of a modern concept because there are only two ways, the word slave is really a misnomer, but because the only two ways you can become a slave is if you steal from somebody and you ha don't have the money to repay them, or you ha or have a debt with that person they can't repay. So you hire yourself out for seven years to repay the person. So you're not placed uh, in, in, in a, uh, a prison, you're placed with a very family that you did something to in order to come to know the other, and to find forgiveness and relationship and you're transformed. Very different than the incarceration system that we have today uh, that leads to recidivism. People are thrown out without any money, without any training. So the Hebrew Bible was very much aware of the importance of uh, honoring the stranger, honoring the orphan, honoring the widow. All our prophets say the same thing. And also I wanna to read to you something after Stephen's uh, beautiful, beautiful presentation, Stephen and Robert, uh, a letter that was written in 1965, 1964, in St. George, St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest city of the United States where 15 rabbis were incarcerated for protesting with Martin Luther King and a beautiful letter they wrote from prison that I'll share with you afterwards. But right now I think it's gonna be time, <clears throat> time for some music. So I'd like to, uh, to introduce to you uh, an extraordinary video celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. Uh, by my friend Stephen Fisk and uh, Robert Corsini. Stephen and I have participated in interfaith events for many years and he's a beautiful soul, a poet, a, a writer, a singer, and Robert is an amazing award-winning uh, filmmaker. So Stephen, uh, exquisite music, musician and composer and Rob Consini, a consummate documentary filmmaker, have combined forces to produce a poignant and powerful tribute to Dr. King. And uh, it's called We Carry the Dream. We Carry Dr the Dream comes at a time of renewed activism and puts the burden squarely on our shoulders to carry on a Martin Luther King's visionary work to end the evils of racism, militarism, and materialism. You should also remember that tomorrow is uh, June, <clears throat> June, Juneteenth, and amongst the many events uh, celebrating Juneteenth tomorrow, 
there's one event that at 6 p.m. we could all join to sing together a song called Lift Every Voice, uh, which will be sung across the country amongst many of the other events that will be, be, be going on tomorrow. So without further ado, let me introduce Robert uh, and uh, Stephen first, and uh, he, he will say some introductory words before the video is played for us. Okay, thank you, Rabbi Mel. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, a few words about the video that you're about to see. I grew up in New York City, and I learned to be a folk singer when I was at the High School of Music and Art in New York. And I loved the songs where people were singing together about righteous cause. And I joined the marches uh, of the 60s, the civil rights movement. And then I traveled to Washington, D.C. Uh, on August 28th, 1963. I had just turned 17 years old. And uh, I was there for the great march on Washington when Martin Luther King gave one of the great American speeches I, uh, about the dream. I have a dream. And years later, uh, I wrote a song with a songwriter friend of mine called We Carry the Dream, which commemorates that event, but also links the, the movement that Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and so many others initiated, and that link exists today. And it's important to connect with the uh, era of the 1960s and, and prior to that, because really we go back 400 years. And these marches today are a continuation of the struggle for justice, the struggle to end racism, and the struggle to uplift all people, but especially Black Lives Matter today. So that's what this uh, video is about. And uh, Robert, I don't know if you're on the line. He is. He is. I don't know if Robert wants to say anything in addition to that. Uh, sure, I'll just, just briefly. Um, it was, uh, it came to my attention uh, that uh, just recently, of course, well, we thought about it a little bit, but August 28th is, happens to be my birthday. I was all two years old when Stephen uh, went to the March on Washington. And I think that's a kind of an interesting aside to the whole story. Um, and then I, I also want to add that, and I thought I was thinking about this today, actually, with all, all the things that are going on. Um, in 1996, I, uh, I went to the Million Man March, actually, as a documentary filmmaker. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience um, it, it, by orders of magnitude larger than the March on Washington initially, but it, it had a semblance of peace and unity, independent of who made the call. It, it, was, it was something that was really moving and, and I thought spoke to all the issues that we are seeing today and uh, very prescient at that. So it, it's, Stephen and I have been in the mix of, of, of this work as, 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 uh, as people of privilege essentially, but We've also always had a, 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 a tuning into um, the issues of, and the struggles of black America. And I think that's really important today as we were hearing over and over again, how important it is for our, our communities of privilege to, to really seriously analyze how we've gotten to this point. And so I'm really pleased and honored to be part of this conversation. And, uh, really thankful to Stephen for inviting me in to help him produce this music video that you're about to see. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so we're ready to go. Okay, let me bring it up right now. Can everybody see a black screen? Yes. Okay. Freedom Now Movement, hear me. We are requesting all citizens to move into Washington, to go by plane, car, bus, any way that you can get there. Walk if necessary. We are pushing for jobs, housing, desegregated schools. This is an urgent request. Please join. Go to Washington. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise 
rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hill Shore, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slaves will they be able to sit down One fine summer day, 1963 The great march for civil rights took on Washington, D.C. They marched for freedom, they marched for jobs They marched for dignity They marched for the conscience of a nation For justice and equality Quarter million gathered there in Washington that day. To hear the Reverend Dr. King lift his voice and say, I have a dream, and we witnessed history. Now it's up to all of us to carry the legacy. So we're saying, we carry the dream. Of the way this world could be We carry the dream Of justice and equality When we gather together We find strength and unity Yeah, we, we carry the dream Of people From the streets of Birmingham to that Nobel Prize he won. Reverend King, let freedom ring, shines his light for everyone. Now people anywhere who've been denied their rights find vision, strength, and inspiration to carry on the fight. So we're saying we carry the dream. Of the way this world could be We carry the dream Of justice and equality When we gather together We find strength in you Ellie, yeah. Oh, 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 it's not. Um... How long ago did the video stop? Uh, uh, three minutes ago. Okay, I think my internet might have hiccuped. Let's see if we can, okay.
It looked like someone named David Adler interrupted with another screen share. What okay. I saw. It should have only been permitted for me to do screen share. I don't know what happened, but let's. Let me try this again. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. I don't want to start over, but I'm going to go back a little bit. Yeah. Can you hear it? Red King, let freedom ring, shines his light for everyone. Now people anywhere who've been denied their rights find vision, strength, and inspiration to carry on the fight. Carry the dream of the way this world could be. We carry the dream of justice and equality. When we gather together, we find strength and unity. Yeah, we carry the dream. All people shall be free. Can't keep a baby from needing to be touched and loved. You can't keep the trees from reaching for the sky above. And you can't stop the river from rolling to the sea. And you can't keep the people from the hunger to be free. Of the way this world could be We carry the dream Of justice and equality When we gather together We find strength and unity Yeah, we, we carry the dream All people shall be free Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, I apologize for the little hiccup, but I think we got it all. Yes. Thank you, Ellie. You saved the day. Uh, from the desert, we'll reach the promised land. We need some darkness to really appreciate the freedom and the gifts that we have. So, so thank you. Uh, <clears throat> before we continue, could, could you hear me now? Because I'm not on the screen. Am I supposed to be on the screen? Let me spotlight you. So uh, we before we hear from our esteemed speakers, I just wanted to share with you a letter uh, that is very famous, but I'm sure about 90% of us on the screen have not heard of it. And, and it's uh, very important. I'm only going to uh, read you parts of it, but it was composed uh, in jail in the St. Augustine, Florida, which is the, the oldest city in the United States and a really deeply racist city at the time. And 15 rabbis were asked by Martin Luther King to join him in, in protest. And this is what they wrote this letter from jail. We went to St. Augustine in response to the appeal of Martin Luther King addressed to our conference, the rabbinical conference, in which he asked us to join with him as a creative witness to our joint convictions of equality and racial justice. 
We were arrested on Thursday, June 18th, 1964. 15 of us were arrested while praying in an integrated group in front of Monson's restaurant. Two of us were arrested for sitting down at a table with three black youngsters in the Chimes restaurant. We came because we could not stand quietly by our brother's blood. We had done that too many times before. We have been vocal in our exhortations of others, but the idleness of our hands too often revealed their silence, an inner silence. Silence at a time when silence has become the unpardonable sin of our time. We came in the hope that the God of all of us would accept our small involvement as partial atonement for the many things we wish we had done before and often. We came as Jews who remembered the millions of faceless people who stood quietly watching the smoke rise from Hitler's crematoria. We came because we know that second only to silence, the greatest danger to a human being is loss of faith in a person's capacity to act. We believe, though we could, well, <clears throat> um, others of us, and yet for all of these brief tension-packed hours of openness and communication, turned an abstract social issue into something personal and immediate. We shall not forget the people with whom we drove, prayed, marched, slept, ate, demonstrated, and were arrested. What we have learned has changed us and our attitudes. We are grateful for the rare experience of sharing even a little bit with this courageous community in their life, their suffering, their effort. We pray that we may remain more sensitive and more alive as a result. We shall not soon forget <clears throat> uh, the bond of affectionate solidarity which joined us hand in hand during our marches through town, not the exaltation which lifted our voices and hearts in unison, nor the common purpose which transcended our fears, as well as all the boundaries of race, geography, and circumstance. These words were first written at 3 a.m. in the sweltering heat of a sleepless night by the light of the one naked bulb hanging in the corridor outside our small cell. They were ironically scratched on the back of the pages of a mimeographed report of the bloody assaults of the Ku Klux Klan in St. Augustine. At daybreak, we revisited the contents of the letter and prayed together for a new dawn of justice and mercy for all the children of God. We do not underestimate what yet remains to be done. In the battle against racism, we have participated here in only a skirmish, but the total effect of all such demonstrations has created a revolution and the conscience of the nation has been aroused as never before. The Civil Rights Bill will become law and much more progress will be attained because this national conscience has been touched in this and other places in the struggle. Now it is up to us to join together and carry the struggle right on and we say, Amen. So it's ironic, uh, over 50 years ago, there was hope that the Civil Rights Movement would lead to a transformation and, a, and an uh, obviation of the racist institutionalization in our country, but we see that the, 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 the pain and the anger resides in black people because nothing has been done. Marching, marching has not really been concretized into uh, laws and protection for black people. Uh, and we hope today that this energy has become so strong that something will actually be done. Well, federally, uh, uh, Karen Bass just introduced the Justice and Policing Act, and locally uh, to obviate the qualified immunity doctrine uh, where policemen can't be sued if they break the, the law. And we have the Poor People's Campaign. We have all these suggestions to empower communities uh, and protect communities and allow a new world to be transformed where people feel safe and people can reach their potential uh, in work, in healthcare, in education, in, in transportation to jobs, uh, in wages that will support their ability to raise their families. And we pledge to work together, black, white, yellow, brown, and every color red, to make this world the place that God has hoped for us and it will only happen if we work together 
face our own prejudices, transform ourselves, look ourselves in the mirror, join hands together, and build a better world. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker this evening, um, Amadi uh, George Hines. Uh, Amadi uh, not only uh, is a leader, he actually knows some people in our community, Janet Bieber, Ruth Belonsky, and uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know him on the phone. So Minister Amadi George Hines has been a religious science minister since 1997. Most recently, he was the associate minister of the KRST Unity Center of African Spiritual Science in Los Angeles until December 2019. He's the former senior minister of the Downey Center for Spiritual Living, in which he served for six years. He's currently on the board of directors of the Friends and Deeds nonprofit, which manages a food pantry, homeless women's shelter, bad weather shelter, and homeless prevention program. His mission for the spiritual community is to be love in action and to create a world that works for everyone through caring, sharing, and healing, to encourage others to promote peace and teach spiritual principles. His message has been to transform the conditions of people of African descent through self-development, self-determination, and nation building. Without further ado, we welcome Mani to address us. Thank you, Brian Mayall, and thank you, uh, Stephen, and thanks to everyone for inviting me today. Uh, the message I'm going to give today has to do with the raising of awareness, of historical awareness. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes. You're Great. I'm garbling a little bit. Okay, I don't know what to do. Zoom um, sometimes can be very What, what might help would be turning off your video. Turning off video? Yes, as much as we would love to see you, sometimes that improves the audio. That's okay. Okay. Okay, well, let's try that. All right. Okay, okay. much better. So, so the video that I saw spoke to the one thing that is so important, that is the humanity in all of us. And I, and I believe that's what everyone is really asking for, to be acknowledged, the humanity in each and every one of us. So I put a title to my short talk today, Do the Right Thing. And by that, it means it's the only thing that Black people could ask of other groups, of themselves, or of anyone else, is to do the right thing by us, which is to follow your conscience, follow the golden rule which is a universal guideline. Deuteronomy 6, 5 tells us to love God with all your heart and soul. Leviticus 19, 18 tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. In the story in Genesis 39, 9, Joseph refused to sleep with Potiphar's wife because he basically said it was not the right thing to do. We are all called to do the right thing by each other. If you're in my place, I believe that you would want an acknowledgement that this society has excluded people of African descent from full citizenship for centuries through systematic racism, often enforcing it with terrorism and brutality. We just recently acknowledged the 99 year anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, in which Black Wall Street and the surrounding areas were burned down by a white crowd that was angry about the self-determination and progress that those Blacks were showing in 1921. This occurred in other cities as well. That wasn't the only incident. Black survivors say that they were intimidated into not even talking about getting justice. Every claim for insurance, restitution, and justice was denied, as far as I know. I believe if you are in my place, you would want to see an acknowledgement of it and a willingness to address the conditions that were brought about by systematic racism. I see the issue is not just an African American issue, but an American issue. Unless everyone is free, no one is free. After the enslavement period, laws called the Black Codes were enacted that targeted Blacks for the purpose of incarcerating them. Vagrancy laws were enacted, which made it illegal for black men to assemble or stand around. 
convicts were then leased to various companies to make money. That period between 1865 and 1936 has been called a period of slavery by another name. After World War II, Black veterans in the South were denied the use of the GI Bill to purchase homes. And we have subsequently seen that home ownership was the basis of the period of prosperity that followed the war. When Social Security benefits were first started, it was tailored to exclude domestic and agricultural workers, professions in which most Black people were employed. It was not until after the Civil Rights Movement in 1965 that, that Black people obtained legal freedom. Then, enter the war on drugs that many people call a war on Black people because statistics in 1982 showed that Black being 13% of the population and 14% of the drug users were 56% of those incarcerated for drug-related crimes. The animosity and distrust that many of the Black community have with the police departments and the criminal justice system is because of the role that, that the police have played in the unequal enforcement of law and in the historical denial of justice based on racism. That is called procedural justice, not real justice. I believe that Black people have gotten a bad rap. We're a very spiritual people, and our indigenous societies were always organized around strong ethical principles. Statistics show that crime is closely correlated to income levels, not racial distinctions. Since this society has a documented history of discrimination, it is time for us to stop blaming those who are the targets of discrimination for their limited conditions. Not to mention the psychological racism caused by a society that raises whiteness as the standard of goodness, of anything good. So I think it's time to start working as a society to address the disparities in wealth and other factors that Black people face as a result of this discrimination. I believe that we need a, a societal effort to address the income, wealth, and justice disparities between the races. I believe that all groups should work together to address the issue of closing these gaps because it's the right thing to do. I believe that we should have a national conversation around reparations involving one, what it means, what does it mean? Two, an acknowledgement that a historical crime has been committed against humanity. Three, an apology by the federal government. Four, a recognition effort through building monuments and changing educational curriculum to include the story of African Americans. And then six, implement prevention, preventive measures. So this program is, I got from Malana Karanga. And so when I was a senior minister of the Downey Center for Spiritual Living, I used to periodically speak up about women's rights issues, not because they directly affected me, but because it was the right thing to do. My effort tonight has been to raise awareness and increased sensitivity to the generational trauma and grief experienced by Black people, people of African descent, because of historical injustice and racism. My message calls for all of us to set the intention to bring balance and justice into our society. At the Nonviolence Workshop conducted by Dr. James Lawson, who was a civil rights strategist for Martin Luther King Jr., as you all, as we all know, I found, I found out something, that the primary financial beneficiaries of the civil rights movement were white women who gained access into excluded professions. That movement also brought in a new standard of justice and equality throughout the world. When Black people prospered, everyone prospered. And when we do the right thing by each other, everyone will benefit.
peace, peace and blessings. Hello, there it is. Uh oh. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Rabbi Mel, you're muted. Thank you so much, Mari, for those powerful, spiritual, uplifting words, uh, challenging us. And, uh, and we will have questions and answers for you after Aisha speaks. Both of you will be speaking, and then we'll open it up for questions from the group. Uh, just as a reminder, any questions, please type them, and I will read them aloud. I'd like now to, it's my pleasure to introduce Aisha Mason who's a transformational counselor, spiritual teacher, community facilitator, and activist. She's a published author focusing on the intersections of social justice, nonviolence, spirituality, and the soul work of social change. For 29 years, she has created programs that support individuals harnessing the power of soul force for personal transformation, social justice, and peacemaking. She served as the founding executive director of the Center for the Advancement of Nonviolence after spearheading the launch of the first season for nonviolence in Los Angeles in 1998. Alicia co-founded then <clears throat> Acts of Power, the liberation of the African-American soul training and community healing forum to assist affected communities in responding to loss and trauma. Alicia recently retired from the American Friends Service Committee, a Quaker-based international peace and justice organization, which she served as the Associate Regional Director of the U.S. West Region. For nine years, Aisha hosted the Morning Review and later the Way Forward radio program on KPFK radio. She's a contributor to many books and articles, and I could go on and on, but I won't, don't want to take time away from listening uh, excitedly to Aisha. to Aisha, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Mel. And I'm really delighted that so many people have joined us tonight. Um, I've seen that video once before and every time I watch it, I'm inspired again. Thank you so much for that, for that, for the music and the images that go with it. Um, Amadi, thank you so much. That was beautiful. I appreciate, I appreciate the uh, historical perspective that you were able to offer us and the very specific um, data that supports what people, you know, the struggle that's going on now. For me, the, my work for justice has never been political and, I've, and I actually get frustrated with the idea that working for justice is a political matter and we shouldn't have political conversations because in my mind it's not a political matter at all it's a matter of my my spiritual values the the code that i live by what i think is important in the world and the foundation of my spiritual values is love i really appreciate uh, one of my favorite quotes by dr martin luther king was uh, the one that talks about the relationship between power, justice, and love. And he says, power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. And for me, that is the right relationship of both aspects of my life and how I think we are supposed to understand how we how we realize how we embody and practice whatever our, our spiritual teaching spiritual path is so for me when i see what appears to be injustice in the world the question becomes what would love do and what would love have me do and does what is what i'm looking at representing love and what how, how would love to respond to this situation i appreciate the statistics that Amadi offered about the conditions of Black America. And I started to look them up. So I'm so glad you took care of that for me. But I started to look them up and talk about the number of Black people that are killed by police who are unarmed, or look at the number of prosecutions for those killings and the number of acquittals, or statistics on discrimination in hiring, or education, or healthcare, or housing, 
or hiring or, or heads of corporations or homelessness. It could go on and on and on. But I think what we're seeing in the video, in the mass marches, in all of the information that's suddenly becoming so publicly available again, again, is a wound that's laid bare. We can see it for our own eye, with our own eyes. And the black community is tired of trying to explain it and defend it and, and justify our, not, not just outrage, but grief. Outrage and grief and passion for claiming our dignity. So the opportunity is before us to not to, I, often it's framed as how do we help black people um, overcome racism? How do we create equality for black people? And I challenge us to see that struggle differently now because simultaneously with black people and brown people trying to overcome the conditions in which they find themselves, there has been America's struggle, America's struggle with racism, America's struggle with oppression, America's struggle with dehumanizing other human beings and exploiting them. And that is the heart of the matter. That is the root cause of this other struggle. So if we are really to heal this nation, if we are really consider ourselves our brother's keeper, we have to realize there is no, there's only us, that this is not happening outside of us. It's not happening in a vacuum. Everyone, everyone in this company is, in this country is participating. Even if you're passive, you are participating. And so to me to help with, to, to participate in what's happening, this incredible moment in our history that is taking place right now, it's unprecedented. In many ways, what's happening now is brand new. And we all get to choose, will we participate and how we will participate. And it's not to help other people, it's to help ourselves. It's to help our own soul fully realize itself. It's to help us be in accord with what we believe. It's to help us fulfill our purpose, which is to help mend the world and reveal the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I don't mean to get too airy with that, but that's really what this is about on a meta level. So it is in our own self-interest. It is for us to be able to live with integrity and to evolve as a human being. It's for us to reclaim our own humanity that we help others. And we say, well, how do I do that? And it's not, in my mind, it's not rocket science. You know, if you see children in cages at the border, you go protest. If you see a whole group of people banned from coming into this country, you go to the airport. If you see images and you find out about someone being killed by police, you go help, you go stand in the streets, you, you support those who are affected. And no matter who the community is, you step forward because there's only one of us. There is only one of us in the mind and in the heart of God. So we look at how am I going to participate? And that's a choice. I mean, what I, did, what I started to think of all these ways you can participate, but everybody on this call has the internet. And you can go on the internet and find lots of ways to help and participate. Before I finish, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. But I think the deeper, maybe more um, supportive thing that I can say is that when, when we step forward to work together, there's the question of educating oneself and doing some not one time only self-reflection, but ongoing self-reflection. When I worked for the American Friends Service Committee, I was often in community, even though I'm black and I'm often the person who is at the, the um, in the power relationship, I'm at the disadvantage. In the American Friends Service Committee, because I was coming from the big organization, the big nonprofit, and I was the one who was the gatekeeper for funding, I often stepped into communities and I was in the power position or I stepped into communities I was unfamiliar with. I was the privileged person. And there were so many times, way too many times, that I put my foot all the way down my throat. Not because I wasn't a loving person, but because I didn't know enough about the community I was in. So I wanna say, if you really want to be, 
if you choose to participate what's happening in this country now, begin to educate yourself and do self-reflection. When you become engaged, there's nothing more enriching and rewarding and challenging than to actually become involved with other communities. That letter that Rabbi Mel met, met, read at the beginning was so moving because in a very short period of time, these rabbis had an incredibly intense experience, but there were relationships that happened like that. There, were, there was an up close and personal experience that transformed them forever and the people with whom they interacted. So what I wanna say about going into relationship is that as with any authentic transformational relationship, it's messy, it's bumpy. Things can be challenging and imperfect, but authentic transformational relationship that requires courage and vulnerability, it also, it also is liberating and evolving. So if you have the courage to begin to get to know people who are outside of your community, you're not just being a nice person or a good person, you are liberating yourself and you are enriching your own experience. It was hard for me to go into communities where I knew I was gonna make a mistake so, sooner or later, I would make a mistake. But I wouldn't trade it for anything because it made me a better person and I met people I'll never forget. The other thing I wanna say is um, do what's in front of you. Like you don't have to go out and do anything big and grand. There are opportunities every day in private conversations in conversations with family, in com conversations with other members of the faith, in whatever your profession is, there are opportunities to stand up and begin to make a difference. We are both, we are all seeking to fulfill our vision for the world, that we, the vision that we hold for this world and to fulfill our, our purpose spiritually. We're both seeking to mend the world and build a spiritual community, what Martin Luther King called the beloved community. What we're seeing now in the streets of this country and around the world is, is just a glimpse of what the beloved community could be again. And we all get to choose how far we go down this road together, how much change we can make in, the, in, the, in, in just a lightning short amount of time. Um, and for me, this is how I live my faith. This really is how I live my faith. And I think each of us have to answer that question for ourselves and determine how we will be in integrity with what we believe. I just want to mention a couple of people and organizations you may want to learn more about as you decide to put your big toe in or wade in deeper. Um, of course, I recommend this group called White People for Black Lives. White People for Black Lives. It's a phenomenal organization here in LA. Also the Racial Equity Institute, which does great work also for, for allyship building, allyship work. Also a group called the, uh, the short is CCEJ, based in Long Beach, but it's the California Conference for Equality and Justice and also nationally, a group called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Um, locally, Rabbi Susan Goldberg is doing great work in, in our community as well. So, um, this time is so radical, so, so new, it can be scary, but I just wanna say again, it's a time of incredible opportunity, incredible opportunity. And, and we get to choose, you get to choose how you're gonna participate. I thank you for, thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Nisha. Um, I was very spiritually moving uh, and uh, I didn't know where you would come at this from, but you, you come from the heart and from your spiritual soul, both of you, and really fits into our school, which uh, ordains rabbis, chaplains, ministers, actually. Susan Goldberg is one of our graduates uh, from our school. 
So um, thank you so much. We're going to open it up uh, for questions and answers. I also uh, have something to say about uh, love and concretization of love through different uh, challenges and, and different ways of operating in the black community rather than pouring money in, et cetera, but allowing the community to empower itself by joining, by listening, and by developing quality and competence, cleaning up neighborhoods so people feel safe and have eyes for each other rather than having police coming in uh, uh, aggressively, et cetera. So I've also been studying over the past months because I spoke last week too at another conference and there's going to, I've learned so much. So uh, I'm, I, I feel stymied by not being able to speak as much, but I might put a point here and there. But let's open it up for uh, questions and, and Ellie will be taking the questions on chat or directly to yeah. her. Um, so please type them in chat. Uh, first question, Aisha, was I, we got the first and the third of those organizations. What was the second one? Um, I can send you a, um, you want me to screen share and just post them? Yeah. That would be great. Okay, give me one let, second. Let me enable screen sharing for you. Oh, thank you. Let me know when I'm good. You should be able to do it now. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we oh, can. You see my whole funky desktop, aren't you? No, we can see just the PowerPoint. Oh, Don't okay, worry. Great. That's good. Okay, so those are people and organizations. And uh, I also have two re uh, written resources that may be helpful. So I'm going to move to that slide as well. Uh, one is racial equity, how to be an informed ally, and you can go to Decent Human Society on the internet. And the other is a wonderful tool cut, toolkit called the What I Can Do Toolkit that's also on the internet. And it's just got tons of information all amassed in one place about a million different kinds of things you can do to be of support and to be engaged in this movement at this time. Uh, Aisha, could you put the first one up just one more time? I want you to take a picture of it. Thank you. There we go. All right. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I let me look and see. I'm gonna try and. I'm gonna come back. If anyone has any questions, please type them in chat, or we can try and have you raise your hands, and I can try and call on you. But it's easier if you type them. Um, Okay, uh, one of our graduates, Ira Rosenfeld, I wonder um, if you have thoughts about how different protests are today than in the past. I'm concerned that there's too much focus on violence and what separates us. I'm also concerned that anti-Semitism has infiltrated some of the protests. You can go ahead. Uh, okay. The the anti-Semitism that I'm aware of is from these right-wing militia, armed right-wing militia that have begun to infiltrate and attack, physically attack nonviolent demonstrators and also instigate violence in the demonstration. In other words, um, what is that word I'm looking for? Undermine the nonviolent demonstration that is the most, um, I see that as the biggest threat to peaceful protest. I, I recognize that there was a brief period of violence. And again, where the source of that violence begun is highly in question. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing I would say about the violence is, um, I feel terrible for small businessmen who have been, who, who having struggled through COVID-19 were then hit by the violence of um, some demonstrators. I feel terrible about that. And I'm gonna say, and when you ask people to turn the other cheek day after day after day and to face injustice and broken promises again and again and again, and their pain is ignored and people are indifferent 
I can't judge when it finally goes pop. And it was, relatively speaking, a small pop. I was very inspired by how quickly the discipline of the demonstration was, um, was successfully re-implemented. And I haven't seen that kind of violence from within a demonstration you know, for, over, for over a week. Thank you, sister. Uh, I would just want to state that, um, you know, one thing as spiritual leaders, our role is to hold a vision of possibilities and to know that, you know, as we can see the answer, that the answer is coming and we're not judging by the appearances. I, I believe that this is that unique moment in history by which we are going to break through and actually usher in a whole new dispensation, a whole new paradigm. And so the key focus for me is to stay, not get distracted by, you know, what's the things that are happening, but to just continue to stay focused on what we know to be true, that there is historic racism, embedded it within this society that continues on into the day and that we must do something about it, to change it. And I believe that each of us, as Aisha has said, needs to find our own, our own role to play in this and not so much focus on what other people are doing, but actually contribute to a just and loving effort for change. And then as we, like, as we like minds come together, we will change things. So I, I just wanted to say that. And then I also wanted to say that, um, as I had mentioned in about the Tulsa massacre, you know, the black community has faced brutality and terrorism and all forms of violence historically. And so, you know, this, and so as a result of this injustice, all of us are suffering. And so if things get a little uncomfortable, if there seems to be some things happening that make you feel bad or uncomfortable, realize that we, th this is, all of us are in this. And so we all have to change it so it can be better for all. So we don't want to get distracted by anything that takes away the focus from the fact that we must change this society. And we can and we will. Uh, one question from Todd. Seems to me that the relationship between the Black and Jewish communities are at a low ebb for a variety of reasons. How would you characterize this relationship and what, what, what might we do to improve it? I think it's about, I know that I'm, I, I, get, I get along, like I tend to look at what I tend to look at um, what's going on around me and what I can do. So the, I have a good relationship with the people that I know who are, who are Jewish. And there's been a lot of history of support from the Jewish community and interaction. And so I think that when we can understand that our struggles are similar, and even as an African liberation theologist, per se person, um, then, so our goal is to, my goal is for self-determination to create control of spaces, control of resources for black people. And I know that that has been an effort of the Jewish community as well as uh, self-defense. So I think that we should, I think we should just come together on like-minded issues with a loving spirit, give each other compassion and not judgment, because it's, you know, it's just like, as Aisha said, relationships are messy, but they're worthwhile. So did you want to add to that, Aisha? Mm. And I got lost in this thread. I'm looking at the question again. I don't. I don't know if relationships are at, I'm looking at this question. I don't know if relationships are at a low ebb. I have, particularly when I was at AFSC, I was working with a number of very progressive Jewish organizations. So I think what unites, what unites 
people and, and people of various faiths are their shared values and living in accord with their values. And whatever other people are doing, ultimately, I'm responsible for, and how am I going to show up? So if there is an attack at a synagogue, am I going to speak up? Am I going to show up? If there's an attack at a mosque, am I going to speak up? Am I going to show up? If, if there is an attack on Black people, am I going to show up? Am I going to speak up? And are you? And are you? I was at one event a long time ago. This did, this did not evolve, involve the Jewish community or the Muslim community, but I was at an event. It was an intergroup event. And um, after everyone does their sharing, Someone asked, are, so, so how are you acting in solidarity with one another? And this one person said, well, we're just so busy dealing with our stuff, we really can't help you. But we had been showing up to support them. And I just was, I was so stunned by that. Because the effect of that is saying, you're not as important. You are not, your struggle, your pain, your suffering is not as, as important as mine. I want to be the person that, I want to be the person that shows up to support people who are suffering, whoever they are, because they're part of humanity and because of the person I want to be. And so that's what we're responsible for. Rabbi Mel? Yeah, am I unmuted? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so thank you. Both Aisha and uh, Amadi are speaking from a very spiritual perspective in terms of human relationships, interconnectedness that transform ourselves and others through that. We empower each other that way. And I think I've always spoken about that. I think it's beautiful. The only addition that I would make, and based on my experience with peace movements over the years, especially in Israel and Palestine, is that even when the grassroots become empowered and speak out and, and, and make some progress, when there's, a when there's not a political where wherewithal, when a crisis comes about, the groups filter, you know, attenuate and, and don't take that extra step. So I think what needs to happen is not only a personal level, that builds from the bottom up and community up. But also we have to make our voices heard politically. We have to have people creating the types of policies that will empower people. Love has to be translated into reality. If a person is hungry, you have to give them bread. You can't just hug them, but you have to feed them as well. And you know the impoverishment that's come from institutionalized racism uh, for many years is a reality. Uh, and I'll tell you some suggestions I have in a moment, but I just want to read to you very short something that Cory Booker wrote at Stanford right after the Rodney King, uh, uh, I would call it assassination, brutal beating. And it's so ironic because it could be read today. In other words, real progress has not been made uh, in ways that it should be. This is what he wrote. He said, persistent unchecked bias in policing and complete lack of accountability is wreaking havoc on the black community. It has been for decades upon decades. We must draft legislation to reform policing in our country. Poverty, alienation, estrangement, continuously aggravated by racism, overt and institutional. Can you leave your neighborhood without being stopped? Can you get a loan from your bank? Can you be trusted at your local store? Can you get an ambulance that dispatched to your neighborhood? Can you get the police to come to your house? Can you get an education in your school? Can you get a job? Can you stay alive past 25? Can you get respect? Can you be heard? Not until someone catches on video one small glimpse of your everyday reality, and even then, can you get justice? Our inner cities are stacks of dry leaves and lumber waiting for a spark. This is but a mere campfire compared to the potential inferno awaiting us. Conditions are worsening, and the Rodney King verdict is certainly of the most egregious injustice in our midst. You could translate that to George Floyd, you know, today, 
uh, nothing has changed yeah, substantially. Okay. So what what I've been looking at is, you know, on the political side, diverting funds. You know, the United States, compared to its peers, spends one third more on security than any of the other nations, and it spends less on social services than the other nations. So diverting funds from, uh, you know, just having police not work on, on traffic stops or, or homeless people at stops or domestic violence, but really dangerous situations and let other people, social workers, crisis people work on that and take that money and invest it in housing, healthcare, education, job opportunities, uh, uh, minimum wages, forgetting student loans, forgiving them, fixing schools, fixing public transportation so they can get to jobs more easily wages, increasing wages, all these things have to do with political wherewithal. So they can be done locally. We have to have our, our city halls get behind that. It can be done federally. Uh, but we cannot rest until we empower our legislators to do what the will of the people want. The last thing I want to say is that the way to do this is not to pour money into communities, but to empower communities. When I was a youngster, my first job out of college in New York City was for a play, an institution called Youth Services Agency, Neighborhood Youth Corps. It was the Lindsay administration, the Kennedy administration. The idea was for to develop quality work sites in the, the impoverished communities. I had a job in Oceanal, Brownsville. I was the only white person uh, walking in those neighborhoods. And when I went into the uh, work site and I said, you know, are the are the kids working? Where are their jobs? Uh, one guy said, to get your white ass out of here. I went to my black supervisor, a powerful woman. She came down with me, grabbed me by my hand, said, don't you ever call my worker that. Don't you ever throw him out. But the idea of it was so profound that if you pour money into a community and people pocket it, nothing's going to get done. But if you train the people, if you give the money to the leaders who are responsible and have everyone grow, and then take pride in the community, I think progress is being made. Those, that program was cut by Republicans eventually. And when it was working, it was beautiful, but we got away from it. I think now people are beginning to get back to that idea of accommodation, listening, empowering, rather than preaching to people. You know? so, um, so I just wanna say that the individual thing is very big, but I think we have to marry it with a political wherewithal, march together, and make sure it's done. Accountability uh, and, and, and uh, just, you know, unions that, that have empowered themselves, the police unions, and don't allow for justice to be heard. And this, people don't feel they can't trust the system, and they give up. So love is the biggest thing. I always preach it, but I want to join together and make sure that we do something about it like other groups are doing. Uh, I told Ellie to also post 10 other groups that we mentioned. I have it right now and I was just about to post it. Join these, these groups as well as the group mm -hmm. you're mentioning. You see it in the, in the chat thing, the mm -hmm. York, LA Voice, Clue, etc. Uh, I think Susan's part of all these groups and uh, we'll all work together. You know, so anyway, I'm talking too, too long, but I just wanted to say that I wish love would be everything, but I think we have to also fight politically to get, get things done. Yeah. Well, l let me say, love is a verb. Yeah. I love that saying, love is a verb. Yeah. So this doesn't really mean much. Love in action matters. And that's what we're seeing is love in action to make change on a, ma on a massive scale. Yeah. I see that uh, Ronnie, Abrams wants to say something, so maybe we'll let her speak first, and then I'll say something. You're you're muted, Ronnie. You just you're still muted, Ronnie. Let's go to. Uh... Amadi first, then we'll come back to you. Okay, well, while she's getting that together, I just, I, you know, I really appreciate what you had to say. And I think that if, if we have to be strategic in mm -hmm. what we're doing, and that's what you were talking about in terms of funding, but we have to have a goal, what are we trying to accomplish? 
So I, and, and so what I was trying to talk about was changing the attitude and sensitivity so that we could begin to look at things with a level of sensitivity. And so I think that self-determination projects are the kinds of projects that should be funded, you know, to help people become entrepreneurs, to help people to, um, you know, build something to sustain the communities, you know, to help them move beyond just being employees to owners, because ownership is really the key. And so, you know, I, I just feel that that in our strategy, if we if we have the right goals, like from us, I can't never get away from taking a spiritual perspective on things. But once you know where you, what you want, when you have the right intention of what you're trying to do, then the universe finds a way to make it happen. But of course, you have to be willing to put in the legwork and the action, as Isha was saying. But we need to make sure that we're targeting the right projects so that we're going to get the kind of result, which has to be self-determination and self-sufficiency for Black communities. Right. That's, that's what I was saying. You said it very beautifully. <laughs> that's what I meant. So. <laughs> Uh, Ronnie, let's see if we can get you unmuted now. Thank there you. we go. Okay. Uh, two things. One is just so that, because um, I noticed the first thing was um, a, a program for white people. We're Jews. We're not all white. I'm not all white. We're, we're just not. So, you know, we're we're made up of many races and but we're jews and uh, um, that's how we live in our world so that's that's number one number two i just celebrated my 75th birthday and so i can't i'm a child of the 60s we were there we were we've already we've gone through this this is not new um and, and I, one of the things that really did work was exactly what, what the Reverend has said is that because I lived in Brooklyn and um, I lived through the, the, the riots, I was a student nurse uh, and I can tell you that um, I went uh, when I needed to go eat, <laughs> I went over the ER um, and, and the blood and everything else. But the community knew that we were there to take care of, of them and they were there to take care of us. And, um, and when Bobby Kennedy came in, um, it was to help the community and help the community build itself. And, and it, it just blossomed. It was phenomenal. And, and just like the rabbi said, and, and Amadi said, you know, that's who we are. That's how we have to live our lives because that's that's who we are in our souls and we have to live together and make our souls meet together but the one thing that we can never do and i've seen it and what hurts most is that when you have a, a, a film like selma where martin luther king is walking and the jews aren't there um, where um, we don't know um, the black history and our kids should have been taught that and we should have been taught that. We can't possibly live together unless we all know the history of both peoples. And, and I hope that if nothing else, this will help us know each other better. I'd, I'd like to interject something, if I may. Am I being heard? We can hear yeah, you, Stephen. Hear you. Oh, yeah. Uh, one of the things that can inspire us is if we look at, look at history. And Martin Luther King, Jr., 
had a wonderful, <clears throat> warm, and deeply spiritually connected relationship with Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Absolutely. They marched together. They, they shared spirit together. They shared the connectivity of oppressed people together. And, and that is inspiring today for all of us to see that relationship. And it's, it's one of the things uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel said in that famous quote, that he learned to pray with his feet when he marched with Martin Luther King, that he was able to learn how to pray with his feet. And I think that's something we're seeing today, that the Jews are marching, the white folks are marching, the Asian folks are marching. We have great diversity. I remember the marches in the 1960s, and it's very different today. There's a lot more young people involved. Young meaning between the ages of, say, teenage or early 20s to 35. There's more, more participants in that age group. And that's a wonderful thing to see the diversity. And to see, it's, it's like an interfaith, intercultural uh, representation of the diversity of America. And that's a great thing. So that's, that's very inspiring to me. And also not to forget that fabulous relationship that Martin Luther King and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel shared. I, I wanted to just say some, thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, I want to just uh, address what Ronnie said, uh, just briefly, which is that, you know, to just help, help us to remember that race is an artificial construct. And so, as I had said, that white was, has been the standard for goodness. But the, to prove that it's an artificial construct, the definition of who's white changes and has changed throughout history. As, we, as you all well know, that of course, Jews were not considered in that class, you know, whereas now perhaps more people consider Jewish people to be white. So it just tells us how, what a foolish concept this whole racial identity is in that sense of it's not really real. And so I, I think that it's really, you know, we just need to keep that in mind that it's really about our humanness. And, and, and just one other thing I want to point out, which is, so, you know, the civil rights movement, another thing we learned from, um, from um, Dr. Lawson was that the civil rights movement was not termed the civil rights movement by the civil rights movement. It was termed that by the media as an, e as an effort to marginalize the effort to make it more into a personal interest. What they called it was a, 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 a movement for justice and equality. And then Malcolm X interjected and said, this is not about civil rights, it's about human rights. And so I believe that if we all just, you know, see each other as humans and, and extend basic humanity to everyone, and then we'll figure out how we can address everyone's specific issues, because we all got them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Amadi. And I see Robert Corsini has a comment in the chat that's, uh, that's very interesting, uh, saying that protests don't always change things. Um, he's speaking about the Iraq war. Uh, even when diverse people came together, age, race, background, it was still ignored. So that supports what I was saying before. We have to concretize this time. Uh, locally, local communities where there's power and empowerment, uh, city halls, to change the laws to protect uh, communities and to empower communities uh, as well. Uh, I love what you're saying. We're quoting Heschel. We're saying one of my favorite quotes of Heschel is, God is either the God of all people or God is the God of no people. Uh, we're all interconnected. We're all, uh, I love this and I love, that's why I love the interfaith movement uh, that I've gotten involved with there, to only to to discover the humanity of the other, only uh, instead of stereotyping and, and abstracting people and, and demonizing them because of our own fears, the only way to overcome that is to get to know the other. Invite people for a meal, you know, uh, on, on Shabbat, on Passover, and uh, to come to our 
your churches, you come to our synagogues, we, we get to know each other. We're all created in the image of God. That's, the Talmud says that's the most important verse in the whole Torah, that every human being is created in the image of God. So um, I think this was a very special evening. It was, it was very beautiful, very inspiring. I didn't actually know which direction it would go. Uh, it was free floating and, and you both tapped into uh, a deep spiritual dimension that's connecting. And I uh, hope, hope that lasts with us and I hope we will follow up with these many organizations uh, that are, are doing wonderful work. And uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's a special day, Juneteenth, uh, that where we can learn more about black history, even though uh, our president said he was the one who taught us about it. Um, so uh, we, we need to really learn. There's a wonderful article, if you want to really get educated, the New York Times Magazine, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, had this 12 page uh, aggregate of writings edited by Emily Bazelon, B-A-Z-E-L-O-N, the New York Times, where she brings uh, six uh, voices, uh, scholars speaking about the history of the country, tra tracing it back, and nuances. It really, uh, I learned quite a bit from it. So in addition to all that you were suggesting, Aisha and, and Mahdi, it's called uh, Emily Baz Bazelon, B-A-Z-E-L-O-N. Look her up in the New York Times, magazine session, it's a section about two, three weeks ago. So uh, let's continue our friendship with each other. We've met some new people this evening, uh, Isha yeah. and, and Amadi. I, I, I know you were also uh, uh, with Michael Beckwith at, at some point at uh, Agape. Um, so uh, we'd love to have you come back again and, and educate us some more. And we'd love to learn from you and uh, create suggestions how we could really on the ground with our feet, help each other to transform the world uh, under, under the spirit of love, spirit of God, spirit of love, brotherhood, sisterhood. Uh, what an amazing time we're living in. I cannot believe what has gone on in the past few months, the COVID and, 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 and the racial injustice and Judge Floyd and, 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 uh, and um, all these things. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, I think I'm missing, I've missed the world because I've been in my home all sheltered. And finally, when I got out and saw the same people that I had ignored before, I said, oh my God, so glad to see you. I, I blessed the world. I had such gratitude for, for freedom that was taken away from me and my, my self-involvement rather than connecting with people. I say, hallelujah, bless you and bless all my friends and our whole community, the AGRCA community and everyone who's attended this evening, because the fact that you showed up and, and said, I wanna learn more, I wanna get connected, uh, gives me great hope. Uh, despite what I read from Cory Booker, and despite what the rabbis wrote 50 years ago in terms of a lot of things remaining the same, I think now it's a transformative moment. I think the universe is speaking to us, wake up, wake up sleepers get moving, and it's not for us to complete the work, neither are we free to desist from beginning it. And as I famously say, any way can, make, can be a way, as long as you make it a way. That's a Hasidic Rebbe teaches us. Any way, as long as we have the proper motivation. So let's join hands. We should sing a song now. Got a song for us, uh, um, Stephen or, or Raymond, or uh, we shall overcome, or how, how can we do this together? Ellie, can we sing together or not? Uh, it's not going to work great, but, yeah. okay. but we can all sing and all be muted and all know that we're all singing together. Okay. <laughs> Someone want to lead us in something? Stephen, you want to lead us in We Shall Overcome, or, or, or anybody else want to lead us in something, or, or a song that you like? Whoops. A song that, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, a song that comes to mind uh, is Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around. Okay. Gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, keep on marching to freedom's land. And it goes like this. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, 
gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom's land. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let no jailhouse turn me around. Gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom's land. Police ain't gonna let no police turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let no police turn me around. Gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom's land. Injustice ain't gonna let no injustice turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let no injustice Turn me around, gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom's land. Beautiful. I'm thinking also of a Hebrew song. Oh, say shalom bim ramav, who ya say shalom aleinu, we all call Israel. Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yako Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Yako Yisrael. May peace and justice reign. And thank you, Ellie, for guiding us through uh, this. Uh, uh, this technological maze and making it all work. And let us say, Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I will be sending out an email to all registrants with the list of organizations that Aisha shared, as well as the ones that Rabbi Mel shared. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. evening. Thank you. Yeah. Till next Thank week. you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you so much. Thank bye, you. George. Bye, 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 Janet. See you later. <laughs> bye, bye, Mel. Bye, bye, Mel. Bye, bye everybody. Thanks, Ellie. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Bye, Bonnie. Everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Um, Bye. Robert and Stephen. Robert and Stephen, while you're still here.